you're familiar with some of the laws about gleaning. In Israel, they were instructed to leave the corners or edges of their fields um, ungathered so that the poor could go and gather there and so be provided for. Right. And I don't, I don't never heard of anybody doing that today. I no, think it's, although there's, I, there's an oddly named local charity here called Niagara Christian Gleaners, but they don't, they don't do gleaning. They gather all the stuff for the people and give it to them, which is not gleaning. Hmm. Yeah, it seems like the the key story involving gleaning is in uh, Ruth, right? Uh, Ruth too. So she goes out and gleans, and when somebody finds favor with her, they they drop extra barley sheaves on the ground for her to pick up. But then she has to go and beat them. She has to take them into town, and then she can she eat to do them. the work. Right. So it wasn't just here is some food for you. It was you had to go out into a field and take this there's some over there we haven't gone over it a second time whatever's left over the first time that we go over it is is for you but otherwise um the the edges in the corners are reserved for you but that's it if you wanted to go and and hire somebody well go out in the field see who's working at the edges those are the people who would love uh, a better wage than i'm working so that i don't starve the dunkin donuts parking lot of the day kind of yeah, I, I remember growing up, there used to be a street corner where all of the, the Mexicans would hang out. Right. And it, if you wanted somebody to come mow your lawn or garden for you, you, you drove by this place, by this particular park bench, and there were usually 20 guys just sitting there, and you'd pick them up in your car, take them to your house, he'd work, and then you'd drop them back off at the end of the day. Yep. People don't uh, congregate there anymore. I don't know if that happens in Canada or not, but it definitely happened where I grew up in near Philadelphia. Hmm. So I think the goal of it is obviously we want to have hundred percent employment, but then we have things like minimum wage, which combat that the, the gleaning laws, obviously it's supposed to teach work ethic and self-sufficiency so that you can't just, well, even in the new Testament, it says, uh, it's in, uh, it doesn't work. Then neither shall he eat. Right. Second Thessalonians three, 10 to 12 for even when we were with you, we would give you this command, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to eat their own bread. We are not, as a society, willing to uh, go through with that second part, the he shall not eat part. Right. I see these things now where people will have, uh, they look like, birdhouses or mailboxes out in the front yard but it'll just be lined with canned food and stuff and it'll just say you know free here take some and i'd say that's oh, a step in the right direction but it's still i mean at least they have to go outside of their house you're not just sending them unemployment checks to their door they have to go out and and get the food but even still they'd have to buy it with the employment check anyway so um, I think the spirit of it is there, but then it's the responsibility of farmers to do that. Mm. The, the, the goal is for everybody to be actually working and it encourages community harmony so that people are interdependent on one another. So you don't just get to be completely separate. I have all my stuff here and then nobody's allowed to come on my property. And then you take care of yourself. And if you're, if you're poor and looking for work, well, I hope you can make more than depending on where you are at $15 an hour or $8 an hour, which if you don't speak the language is probably going to be a challenge. We've cut off all of the barriers to entry to work, to survive. And we feel really good about ourselves. I think it's designed as a a stopgap so that you don't get the welfare style program use and unemployment it's also that the opportunity to work enough to survive is required to be offered by everybody in a in a city or a countryside i think a lot of people would think of they're they're being really charitable by asking farmers to offer that but it's not charity it's it's an obligation Right. You don't have an option not to do this. 
outside an agrarian society, like how could this be applicable to other occupations or can it be? Because I mean, most of us don't have fields that we can leave the corners. Of. Right. And the people that do farm, they typically don't just own, you know, a few acres. That's usually hundreds. Right. And so it's a big ask on a very small and number of people. out in the middle of nowhere and not typically near where all of the homeless and down on their luck people live. Right. And part of that, I would guess, is due to the, the, the cap on the interest rate that governments like to set. So it makes land prices super expensive. So it's not really worth it for individuals to own huge chunks of land. If, I mean, they, they could, you can't afford it unless you get a loan and even still it's difficult. I uh, think inheritance is the typical way to get farmland anymore. Yeah. So it, like what would be an agricultural, an alternative to an agricultural society, since most of us don't own land. What I've seen a lot of, uh, one church that I grew up in did this. They, their, their ministry to people who needed help was they would take them in to sign them up for food stamps, unemployment, social security. Like Oof. that was the church helping them. <laughs> so instead of taking responsibility for the people in your own area, you, you take them to go sign up for another country's programs like if we're if the church is a nation and we're supposed to be functioning as our own country then how does that work it's like a rejection of taking care of your own poor so how can you expect to build a thriving thriving society for people that come to you for help and you literally you point them to someone else yeah that does put uh, i guess that does sound like it it, it does seem like it would be a little bit trickier, like if you're a really small church, to be able to provide for somebody who came to you for help. But I don't, I don't know everybody's uh, balance sheets and how that would actually work. But it does seem like you're, it's going the wrong direction if you're actually just pointing people to the government who just takes all that money from somebody else and forces the charitable giving. So I think the the result of a, a whole country or city's refusal to offer gleaning basically like god's judgment against us for that is the government giving imposing minimum wage laws because it feels like well people have to be able to work to live well then minimum wage cuts off the lowest skilled workers now it's not legal to pay them to hire them and to have that be like a long-standing arrangement and so they get unemployment checks. Like what else are they supposed to do? If they can't glean and they can't work for low wages. Uh, yeah. If they can't find a work for lower wages, then what are they supposed to do? They're not going to, if the minimum wage goes to 15 bucks, you're not going to pay some lazy teenager to do a job. So you're going to get self checkouts instead. Or somebody new to the area who's having trouble paying rent doesn't speak the language very well, doesn't know the culture very well, might even be at an early stage of getting into a society where they're inadvertently offending people just because they don't know that's not acceptable here. Yeah, and a lot of the lowest paid jobs do tend to be uh, customer facing, which makes it a challenge if you don't know the language, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it's in one sense, you know, as much as I hear people and I agree with them as they rail against the minimum wage hurting the low wage workers, I mean, they're kind of between a rock and a hard place. What else are they supposed to do? They can't go into a countryside. They'll get picked up. They'll get arrested probably if they go just start as a rule. Just this is my new mode of survival. I'm going to go find some corn or some wheat or something growing somewhere and I'm going to just pick enough for me to eat. In that story with uh, Ruth, I did the calculation for how much she gathered in a day. Now, obviously, this was with them giving her a whole bunch of extras. Make sure to drop extras so that she can take those. But still, after an entire day, she she gathered somewhere between like 30 and 50 pounds of barley. After okay. she after she had beaten so it, like, that was the edible part left for her. Well, how, how long is the, harvest, is the barley harvest? Yeah, that I'm not familiar with. 
So you couldn't do that all year round. So right. You have to store that up. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that would also, that's really interesting. So that sounds like it would even encourage people to do more work. It's not just hand to mouth day to day. It's they're able to gather enough to keep themselves going through the winter as well. It's not like men in the wilderness, which was a guaranteed every day, except for Saturday thing. And this also was related um, to the feast of booths. We have our culture designed because we won't take care of the poor. Well, there's the feast of booths is designed around celebrating the poor and giving them, inviting them to the feast. Uh, in Deuteronomy 16, it says, you shall keep the feast of booths seven days. When you've gathered in the produce from your threshing floor and your wine press, you shall rejoice in your feast. You and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless and the widow who are within your towns. For seven days you shall keep the feast of the Lord your God at the place the Lord your God will choose, because the Lord God will bless you in all your produce and all the works of your hands, so that you will be altogether joyful. So there's a week-long feast every year where you invite the poor to come feast with you. Oddly enough, the Muslims are doing that right now. For their celebration of the lesser Aid. they're celebrating the... Uh, Abraham's willingness to set to sacrifice his son and part of that is gathering food and like giving gifts of food to everybody and inviting everybody to a big feast. I am not familiar with that. That's that's very interesting. Of course in their version it's uh Ishmael who was sacrificed not Isaac. R of course. But that's not even in the Quran that should by tradition. Hmm. Very interesting. There are some things that Muslims do better than we do, and it's... I mean, their local societies here, they definitely have a good sense of community, and my church has that too, but I wouldn't say that other local churches have that same level of connectedness that they do. But then again, uh, the Muslims around here are all immigrants, so they tend to stick together. Mm. The question is, like, how do you start even moving a, a city or a culture in this direction? Uh, do you just start, I mean, people who don't own land start calling all of the farms in the area and say, you must start doing this? How First do you, you convince them? What's in it for them? What does this principle look like now when we don't have an agrarian society? And then once you know what it's supposed to look like, then you can try to figure out steps from point A to point B. But the, of course, the first goal, the first step would be to get everybody to want to move from step A to step B. <laughs> Yeah, well, it'd start with, it would start with a church first, like unbelievers. The culture, and to start that, we have to Christianize the Christian church. Right. <laughs> yeah, there's the first goal. Stop, well, we talk can to teach people the world the how to first. do these things. We've got to teach the church to want to do these things. Right. Oh, but that's Old Testament. That's all out of date stuff. We don't have to do that anymore. Man, that is such an uphill battle. Yeah, I think a lot of it's going to be determined by people just starting to do it. Because you can argue mentally with something all day long as to why these things that grow on a lemon tree are going to be inedible. But when you start harvesting lemons from them and, and selling them and people taste them, you really can't argue with it anymore. That, oh, this is good. I'm tasting the fruit. I think that's what you got to do with these types of things. It's like, just start doing it find anybody who will listen, start doing it and show the fruit from it. Cause until you do that, people can argue with, Oh, well that won't be effective anymore because God doesn't work like that anymore. It's easy to nay some, say something you haven't ever seen. And that's been a struggle for me is you, you feel like you should be trying to do something and modeling something, but then you've never actually seen a model yourself. Right. Or the last time it was done was 800 years ago, and it was done very poorly, if it was done at all. Rush Dooney wrote about people in Armenia who used to allow people to glean in their fields. And he also said it was early practice in the United States, mm -hmm. but I haven't been able to find anything on that. Even when I Google it to see if anybody's doing anything like that today, or if there's any type of ministry or somebody who's like specializing on this, going around speaking i find these ministries or organizations that have nothing to do with actual gleaning it's like they mean gleaning by learning or 
or something. It has nothing to do with it. Charities, uh, I think, well, they probably don't have access to farms where they can even do something. Or they're like the, or like the group around here, Niagara Christian Gleaners, where they're basically just getting surplus produce from grocery stores and farms, and then they're uh, distributing it. So they almost like they almost have to do the legwork for the people who are receiving it because it, it's logistically difficult to get everybody out to the places that all this food is coming from. Right. We could uh, get rid of laws that say that people aren't allowed to dumpster dive buying grocery stores. Oh, that would be a start. Because that's like an anti-gleaning law. <laughs> right. I mean, it's already a- trash. What, now a- what do you have against people getting it? I had a coworker who would pour bleach on the food that we threw out at CVS. Somebody is so hard up they need to dive in the trash for Easter candy. Like, let them have it. Or set it next to the dumpster. <laughs> yeah, or like call somebody up. And so, well, the one, t- the one that we had, a, we had over two hundred uh, Cadbury eggs. So I actually called my brother up and said, "Hey, you want some Cadbury eggs?" The only instance in my memory of cultures that have taken a, a, a U-turn. And gone from like a modern nation to a, a huge focus on agriculture was Germany and Japan after World War II. It's sort of like they got slapped so hard upside the head with this is not the way that you're supposed to be ha- acting. And they got punished for it and sanctioned for it. They turned around really started focusing on agriculture that's even carried over to today has there ever been a country that just sort of realized that it was going the wrong direction and turned itself around instead of stretching itself too thin in like a military conquest and then finally realizing oh maybe instead of trying to conquer everybody we should start planting stuff i mean there's king josiah he tried refresh my memory on that story well it was after finding the law yeah, he was a young king, and he was trying to do right. He was trying to be a righteous king, and they found the law, and they're like, oh, snap, we're supposed to be doing all these things. And they, were, they went and put on sackcloth, and there was mourning, and then he tore down all the high places. But I think the momentum of several generations of Baal worship, etc., can't be turned around in a single generation. Seems to be the takeaway from that story that I get. I remember that story. I didn't. I was thinking that you meant that there was a particular a reference to them doing agriculture again. But yeah, it does say it like in oh, terms just, of everything. Yeah, they tried to go back to doing everything. And yeah, I think it does. It does focus more on the. He cut down a lot of the high places, or maybe even all of them. But then it didn't stick. Yeah, but has any country actually? Like we always kind of hope that. Are, we'll be able to get in leaders that will turn things around, but has that actually ever happened? That's a good question. Yeah, I think it's always dependent on individuals to do it collectively. Because it, it, it seems like it really takes something catastrophic like a war to actually get people to kind of force people to sit down and think about what they're doing. I know individuals do it, but I think, it, you know, an yeah. aggregate collectively you would have to carve out a chunk maybe of a certain state and say it happened here, but it's kind of hard to, to pinpoint those. We can start with the church. Everything starts yeah. with me. What's that saying? You be the change you want to see in the world. Yeah. Start with yourself, start with your local church. And there's a lot of work just to do there. Yeah. If you're not willing to, to make a change in your own life where there's nothing stopping you, then like what makes you think that you're going to do something when it's all of a sudden illegal, take responsibility for everything you have the, within your power to do right now, and then figure out how to get the leverage to maybe even start disobeying in a godly way. I was watching a John Stossel video two weeks ago. There was this group of parents that wanted to get this new insulin monitoring system approved by the FDA and it was going to take like a decade or more because the ones that are out there were really inaccurate and very expensive. And so the families banded together and I think their slogan was, we will not wait or we are not waiting. And so they just made their own product to test blood sugar 
and is better than everything that's out there. And they just completely circumvented the FDA and they started giving it to families who needed it with small children with diabetes. And I don't think the uh, FDA wanted the PR nightmare of them trying to take away blood sugar monitoring devices for children. And so I think that was a very strategic effort on their, their part. And he also talked about people giving prosthetic limbs and designing prosthesis for, for children with missing limbs. Nobody will really fight you on that one. So does the FDA just not approve something or do they actually forbid you from marketing something? It's a federal crime or, or there's fines or something attached with it. You can't just start manufacturing and selling your own medical testing devices. For testing blood sugar anyway, you have to get the device approved by the FDA. I suppose that's all for our safety, right? Right, until children are, are dying because of inaccurate testing stuff that was approved yeah. 10 well, years ago. If the regulations themselves cause harm, then it's kind of counterproductive. Yeah, it was a really interesting Stossel video. I think the title of the video was Don't Ask Permission. And it was about, okay, if you really have other people's interests at heart and you want to innovate, don't wait for regulators to tell you, okay, you can do it. Just start helping people. And if you get smacked down, maybe somebody will start a Kickstarter in your name or something. Yeah, you hear that once in a while, like better to seek forgiveness than to ask permission. And I really don't like that as a concept, but it does seem to work. Trying to be upright and by the book and somebody else who just ignored all the rules, they get rewarded because they were first. And I keep on thinking about that restaurant food thing. So we don't have an agrarian society, but in urban societies, where the mo there's the most need, there are a lot of restaurants and grocery stores. So if, even if restaurants just let the leftovers out behind the store, I think that could be a sort of gleaning. So I know in the UK, there are regulations on what, like how they're supposed to dispose of things like used cooking oil. I was looking up a video on people using used cooking oil and modifying their car engines to be able to run on it instead of diesel. You can do it for yourself, but if you start picking up used cooking oil and cleaning it and selling it to other people or even giving it away to them to use in their diesel cars, that's, that's against the law. No recycling. So the restaurants have to throw it away. Or you, or you have to use it for personal use. You can only use what you pick up yourself. I worked at Tim Hortons. We used to throw out up to like 100 muffins, bagels, and donuts every single night. And we were not allowed to give it to anybody except the assistant manager was allowed to get, take it home for his potbellied pig. But there were a couple of times that we had so much excess that I actually did throw some of it in my car and give it to my brother and sister-in-law and their six kids. Even that would be better, but even still, the law for gleaning says they're supposed to be able to get it at harvest. So they yeah. get the, they get in one sense, the gleanings of the first pick off the vine, not it's been cooked and sold. And then anything that you didn't, weren't able to make use of it, then you can give that. Wait, they're the same quality as what the stuff you were selling for profit was as opposed to old stale stuff. Yeah. Something to think about. A lot of food for thought. No pun intended. 